Many in the pro-life movement have come out saying that, in the debate over abortion, it often seems there's not much room for nuance, you're either for it or against it. That's because that's how it should be. So a lot of people believe that abortion is illegal, but in spite of the fact that the pro-life lobby around the country is claiming that there's 13, 14 states that are quote unquote abortion free, nevertheless, they're really not. Without apologies, some things in life don't always give room for a middle ground or second guessing. You're either alive or dead, and since we're talking life right here, I don't see the reason why there should be a gray area concerning an issue as delicate as abortion, and the Bible doesn't think so either. Stay tuned because in this video, I will be exposing the satanic objective behind the abortion law that has placed many women all around the world in two activist groups, pro-life and pro-choice. What do they symbolize and does the Bible even support these? The scriptures have made it as clear as the running waters when it says in Exodus, thou shall not kill or take another's life. But it's unbecoming when some very pro-life men of God feel the need to tweak the issue of abortion as though it is not a human life that is in the woman's womb. The pro-life and pro-choice movements have been around for quite some decades, but they gained more significance following the no abortion bill signed into law in many U.S. states not too long ago. This law led to several women across America and other parts of the world dissecting views and protesting the bill. Some were outrightly against the bill, stating that it contradicts human rights and trampled on the right for women to decide what to do with their bodies as they deem fit. Others simply stated their disapproval of the pro-life thing because it contradicts what the Bible and the law say about all lives, including that of the unborn fetus. Now this is where the bone of contention lies, because if the legislators meant to enact a law to safeguard against abortion, why now suddenly turn around under the pro-life clause to say the woman committing abortion is not guilty of taking out a life. Excusing the mother from the abortion outrightly places her under immunity and makes it impossible to criminalize her action, even when they all know that having the procedure tantamounts to murder by whatever means it is being done. The pro-life movement has a lot of women who are active in it who have had abortions, and they very much argue that the mother who got the abortion is also a victim. Ladies and gentlemen, this is happening in the world right now. They have tried and failed in the past, but now they are legalizing the very act of abortion under our noses. And the media, the churches, and the civil rights groups are slowly aligning with this. This is what they're feeding young girls in schools these days, that mothers who have the procedures are the victims of abortion and not the innocent child who's being removed. Imagine what happens when no institution stands upright enough to take the bull by the horn, to call a spade a spade. It'll be a complete erosion of morality, a sense of right or wrong from society. Now, what you're going to see next is something so satanic that's creeping right under our nose. You'll see how the devil is manifesting, riding on the waves of human moral depravity to take hold of the world. And he's doing this openly, no longer hiding in plain sight. The magazine known as Cosmopolitan which is supposed to be a voice for young, single, and married women, is purportedly decked in Satanism. It has links with the Satanic Temple, which conducts fetish abortions for women. When you take a look at the magazine's website, the opening statement says, the Satanic abortion clinic that's pissed off pretty much everyone and might beat the bands anyway. What does this tell you? It presumes that this group aims to gain access someday and subdue the legislation concerning abortion in US states not just in New Mexico where they reportedly operate. You can see it's no longer a hidden secret. The website contains so many satanic narratives about how the satanic temple conducts abortion, but I'm just going to highlight this one for you. You can take a look at them yourself. TST is also known for its Gorilla Street Theater. At one 2016 demonstration, temple members wearing adult diapers and baby masks disrupted a Christian-led anti-abortion protest with a BDSM stunt that involved flogging one another with whips which one TST member said was a commentary on the Christian rights fetishization of the fetal image. This type of public mischief is a core TST tenet, says Blythe. Basically, Chalice Blythe is an ordained minister of Satan, whatever that means, and also the spokesperson for reproductive rights in the temple. I don't want to go into further details about the nefarious operations of this satanic clinic, but you can check out their website yourself and read. And as a precaution, all of what you'll find there is very spooky and horrifying. Once again, don't take my word for it. 
If you're intrigued by this video so far, quickly give it a thumbs up and please subscribe. The saddest part is that many so-called pastors do not see anything wrong with it. The few ones that actually do are not doing enough to warn against this slow but steady satanic encroachment gradually permeating the society. Only a few preachers, especially white evangelicals, actually believe that abortion is a sin and a form of murder that violates God's commandment to protect human life. This set of people oppose abortion in all or most cases and support laws and policies that restrict or ban it. They also promote alternatives to abortion, such as adoption, abstinence, or parenting support. They see abortion as a threat to the family, the nation, and the end times prophecy. However, other preachers, especially mainline Protestants, still maintain that abortion is a personal decision that should be left to women and their doctors. They support abortion rights and access and oppose laws and policies that interfere with women's autonomy and health. They also advocate for comprehensive reproductive health care and education. They see abortion as a matter of justice, compassion, and human dignity. Yet some black evangelicals have mixed or nuanced views on abortion, depending on the circumstances, the reasons, and the stages of pregnancy. They oppose abortion but support its legality, and sometimes vice versa. They also support abortion in some cases, such as rape, incest, or fetal anomalies, but not others. They have different opinions on when life begins or the fetus becomes a person. They see abortion as a complex and controversial issue that requires empathy and dialogue. Abortion cannot be debated without considering the quality of life in our urban schools. It cannot be debated without considering the high unemployment rate in our communities or the disparities in our health care. We cannot talk about abortion without talking about the high rates of infant mortality in our community. We got to talk about it. In his opinion, from the video you just saw, Reverend Clinton L. Stansel, the pastor of Wayman AME Church in St. Louis, articulates a position that is heard all too rarely, particularly among faith leaders. And mind you, he, like other black evangelicals, is pro-life. But since when was the issue of deciding to get an abortion strictly for financial incapability? We've seen well-to-do women who can single-handedly take care of a child opting for the procedure. So it's not purely an economic thing, as dear Reverend Clinton says. This demonstrates the real reason abortion is still legal in the United States during and after Roe v. Wade. The pro-life movement claims to believe that they believe that what is in the womb is fully human and worthy of protection. However, they do not believe that the child deserves equal protection. There's a 30-minute long documentary called The Fatal Flaws, Lies, and Laws. The documentary analyzes these issues widely, and you will see the true objective behind this pro-life and pro-choice movement. The first time I spoke to Dr. Brent Leatherwood was at the Southern Baptist Convention uh, when we met in Anaheim, California. And I asked Dr. Leatherwood if it really was his position that the mother who willfully chooses to kill her own child, not under coercion, not under duress, but a mother who just chooses to kill her child, is she really not guilty before God? And should she really not face any consequences under the law? Here's the reality. You're not going to get me to say that I want to throw mothers behind bars. That's not the view of this entity. That is not the view of this convention. It is not the view of the pro-life movement. You see, if he would have finished the statement, Brent Leatherwood doesn't want to lock up women who murder their children in the womb. The second time I talked to Brent Leatherwood was at the following Southern Baptist Convention in New Orleans, which is just right down the road from where I pastor my church in Louisiana. And since Dr. Leatherwood would not answer my first question on whether or not the woman who murders her child by abortion is guilty before God and under the law, I decided to ask him another question. Okay, you've already told me that you don't believe women who kill their children in the womb should face any consequences under the law. How about that same child after being born? Should a mother who kills her newborn child face any consequences under the law? Brian, thank you for that question. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to once again restate where we are. And I know that this is something that's important to Louisianans in particular, Louisiana Baptists in particular. We have said all along that abortion is murder. And we will never waver from that. Scripture mandates. 
In this clip, you will learn why they have worked to stop the abolition of abortion. You will hear it yourself, from their mouths with confidence. They don't believe what the Christian Church believes about the issue. It isn't a difference in strategy. It's a different worldview. It's a different desired outcome. The pro-life movement, as stated earlier, believes that human life begins at conception and that the unborn child has the same right to life as any other human being. They argue that abortion is a form of killing that violates the dignity and value of human life. They also claim that abortion harms women physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and that it is often coerced or pressured by others. They advocate for alternatives to abortion, such as adoption, parenting support, and abstinence education. The pro-choice movement, too, believes that women have the right to choose whether or not to continue a pregnancy based on their own personal circumstances, beliefs, and values. They argue that abortion is a safe and legal medical procedure that respects women's autonomy and bodily integrity. They also claim that abortion benefits women's health, well-being, and equality, and that it is often a responsible and compassionate decision. They advocate for access to abortion, as well as comprehensive reproductive health care and education. This points to their differing views concerning when they think human life begins, or when the unborn child acquires personhood, rights, or interests. But know this, a person is a person irrespective of size, level of physical development, or mental consciousness. An unborn child is a person regardless, and if the law wants to advocate for human life, it should do so without bias or favoritism to the mother against the baby in cases of abortion. It is wrong to think that abortion is allowed by biblical law because it is not murder. This ignores the fact that abortion is still punished. Even an accidental miscarriage has a fine. A Jewish scholar says that there should be no fine for accidents, but God loves unborn babies and finds those who cause their miscarriages. Using a biblical way of reasoning, we can say, if accidental miscarriage is fined, how much more should intentional abortion be punished? Secondly, shielding women who commit abortion from the law is telling them they're not guilty even though they've committed murder. They're being told since they're not guilty, not sinners, they don't even need to ask for forgiveness, and this doesn't seem right. Hear what the psalmist says in chapter 51, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and be whiter than snow. The pro-life movement is not helping these women. More than the fetus, it refers to them as victims of abortions. This is not right. Stop shielding them from receiving the forgiveness of God that has so graciously been given. If you'd kindly support this channel by clicking on like and subscribe buttons, that will be great. Thanks and see you next time.